uh, please let me introduce you uh, to the audience. We have, uh, this is a hybrid meeting. So we have uh, both students here uh, in the lecture hall. Uh, and we also have students participating over Zoom. Uh, so when it's time for questions, which we will do after your talk, uh, we will take questions from the audience that is here and also from the chat. Um, but I would like to welcome you, Mike, to Stockholm. Uh, are you in London right now? Or? I am, yeah. Yeah, so Mike is a researcher at Queen Mary Institute in London, uh, where he works on AI for games and in particular PCP. He's also the founder of ProcJam. Um, and the author of one of the coolest programs uh, that exists, which is Angelina, who can actually make her own games as being an AI. Uh, so it's a real honor to have you here, uh, Mike. I'm so happy to, to see you too. Um, so yes, please uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, it's really wonderful to be here as well and I'm very jealous to all of you that you get to uh, be in a class taught by Miriam because uh, she's one of my favorite people in games research um, and that was why it was impossible to say no to this opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, so thank you for that intro Miriam um, and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mike um, and Miriam's given you a little bit of background on me already um, but today I want to talk to you about procedural generation of course and I understand that you've learned a little bit already and I wanted to do something a little bit different with this talk. I hope you enjoy it. Um, we're going to come to it from a slightly different angle and think about um, why we use procedural generation and what it can do for us and what it's like to actually use it in the wild. So I'm going to start my stopwatch so that I know when we're 15 minutes over time. Um, I'm only joking, Miriam, don't worry. Um, so a little bit of background. Miriam's already said a little bit, um, but I, I'm an AI and games researcher and also a game designer. Um, and I work in a field called automated game design where we're interested in using um, PCG techniques to build AI that can design games. So we tackle really all kinds of different generative tasks. And I also work in a field called computational creativity. Um, and in there, we're really interested in how AI is perceived by people. So we're not just interested in whether AI can make a game that's good, but we're interested in how people feel about that game and how they feel about the AI. Do they believe that it's independent? And do they believe that it's creative? So there's a lot of really interesting like philosophy in that too. I also make games as part of my research and in my spare time, like uh, Condition Unknown and Rogue Process that we're gonna see a little bit of later. And if you wanna talk to me, but you don't get a chance to answer, you know, ask a question today, or maybe you're a bit shy or anything, please feel free to contact me later. I'll have all of my details at the end uh, of the talk. So I am here today to talk to you about procedural generation. Um, and when we think about procedural generation, maybe it's completely new um, for some of you, or maybe you've played some games like Minecraft, which, which this uh, screenshot is from. Um, we think about certain kinds of things. Some of us might even kind of be negatively biased uh, towards procedural generation. It's been used in very specific ways uh, in the past so far. I uh, founded a game jam all about procedural generation. It's actually kind of a, a community. We all get together every year and it's very laid back and relaxed. We share lots of resources and help. Um, and it's all about procedural generation. And the slogan of the procedural generation jam is make something that makes something. And I really like this slogan. Um, I think uh, I'm very proud of it. And I think it's a great invitation to sort of join the community and start making things. And when I sat down to make this talk, this was the first slide I wrote. Um, but then I realized that although it's a good invitation, it doesn't really um, help people kind of get into it. And, and a lot of the questions that we get are things like, well, where do I start? What techniques do I use? Um, it doesn't tell you what it's like to really make uh, a procedural generator. And so today I'm gonna come at it from a different angle with a different method, message um, and a bit of a uh, stretched metaphor. <laughs> But uh, today I want to talk to you about procedural generation as a form of gardening. And I want to think about what that means with you and think about hopefully how that can give you a perspective on what I think procedural generation is for and how to go about thinking about it yourself. So I hope this is fresh and interesting to you. Um, and I hope that you, you enjoy coming on this uh, weird metaphorical journey with me. So the inspiration for the garden 
happening metaphor actually comes from a couple of places. The first is Max Kreminsky's amazing talk at the Roguelike Celebration in 2018. All of these talks are up on YouTube, and I really recommend looking at them if you're interested in this topic. But Max's is maybe one of the best talks I've seen given at uh, the event. And in it, they talk about gardening from the perspective of the player. So they talk about games in which you have a sort of gardening-like approach, uh, a relationship with the game world. So this is a screenshot from Animal Crossing, and you're really encouraged to sort of engage with these randomly generated worlds. But as I rewatched Max's talk, I began to think about how gardening kind of relates to how we build procedural generators as well. And it made me think of another example, which is um, Emily Short's... Uh, Emily Short's Annals of the Perigues. Um, and this is maybe one of the best pieces of generated text um, in existence, I would say. You can get it online at inthewalls.itch.io. And it is a 50,000 word travel guide. Um, and there's lots of segments like this. So this is describing a place called Hesselchester. And you have like these poetic descriptions of the place, sunlight filtered through rustling leaves. And it tells you things like the mythology of the area, where you can stay, where you can get a hot meal, um, who is the lord of the area, um, all sorts of things. And it's all generated by Emily. And in fact, it was written for something called the National Novel Generating Month, where the challenge is to generate a 50,000 word document um, in one month using generative techniques. And the thing that's really interesting about it is, um, oh, it is that uh, Emily um, includes an appendix at the end um, where she describes the process of writing the annals. Um, and I think it's one of the best segments uh, about procedural generation that's ever been written. Like it's one of the best pieces of writing about procedural generation. Um, and if you only look at one thing as a result of this talk, I really recommend you pick that out and have a look at it. And there's a few sections in there that really stand out to me. And I, I've quoted one of them here. Emily writes, I spent considerable time working on the machine, meaning the, the procedural text generator, and its various features before I produced anything that I considered worth recording here. I would generate a few provinces worth of content, so that's descriptions of like little towns, and then I would add that content to this file, and then I would read through it, and then I added to the engine new content elements based on the inspirations of the text generated so far. So Emily had this really interesting loop of working with her procedural generator. She would write and edit things, look at the text that it generated, add things to the final output, go back to the generator. And it reminds me a lot of the way people nurture and tend to their gardens. Um, Emily would add some, um, some things to the generator, plant some new flowers, prune some uh, dead foliage off that she didn't like, and then wait and see what grew, what bloomed, um, and then come back to the generator, make some changes and go through this sort of cycle. And I began to think about how sort of satisfying this metaphor was, not just because of this cycle of, of growing things, but also the sort of two extreme types of garden really relate uh, very well to um, types of content that we put in our games and where procedural generators start from. So I want to tell you about what I think that the two extreme types of garden are and how that relates to procedural generation. So, in some gardens, we have complete control over absolutely everything in the garden. So this is uh, an ornamental sort of garden from uh, Iran, where almost everything you can see here has been precisely and perfectly placed. Every flower, every tree, the pathways, the water, um, you know, the, the hedges have been trimmed to be a particular shape. And we can think of these sorts of gardens as similar to when we make content for our games by hand. So when we're designing a game, um, we place every single uh, individual bit of content in the world, in the soundtrack, in the storyline, exactly where we want it to be. It is perfectly designed as we wish it to be. There's nothing uncontrollable about it or unpredictable. And this is actually where a lot of procedural generators start from. So if we are really good at level design, maybe some of you have made platforming games before, um, that might be where we want to start off with our procedural generator. We already know how to make really good platforming levels. And so what we often do is we start from this point of uh, uh, something that we know very well, and then we begin to think, how can we give up control over little parts of this? How can we begin to let some wilderness kind of creep in and not have everything so perfectly designed? And this is um, a very common path for, for many types of game designers. So Derek Yu, for example, um, whose name you, you may or may not recognize, but 
Um, back in the uh, sort of early 2000s, Derek was working on a number of indie projects on his own, and he got a lot of experience designing levels. Um, and all of these games are completely, perfectly controlled. They are tended to in ornamental gardens where every single part of the level is exactly where Derek wanted it to be. But later on, closer to the 2010s, Derek was starting to make a game called Spelunky. And in Spelunky, Derek wanted there to be some variation. He didn't want players to be able to memorize what the levels were going to do. He wanted there to be unpredictability. In other words, he wanted to take this perfectly ornamental garden that he would normally design and then allow it to sort of grow outside of the templates a little bit and do things that he wasn't expecting. And so if you've not played Spelunky before, um, this is what the game looks like when you're sort of playing it. You're quite zoomed in. But if we zoom out, we can see um, the full scale of a level here. And if I add in some lines, um, what you'll see is that this level is made up of a four by four grid of smaller rooms. And each one of these rooms is based on a template that Derek designed himself. So Derek's brought his knowledge about designing levels, the skills he already has. And then he's found a way to allow this, a very simple algorithm to take those levels and mix them up um, to, to give up some control that he would normally have over this process of level design. And he actually layers on a little bit more than that. So each of these templates he designs, they actually kind of look like this. Um, and these, these tiles that I've labeled as 50%, when they get loaded into a level like this, the game rolls some dice and either that's gonna be a solid block if 50% rolls high and it's gonna be empty if it rolls low. And there's loads of little rules like this for adding in traps and enemies and treasure. Um, and what it means is that the heart of Spelunky is designed by Derek but the game that people play is a bit like a garden that's been slightly overgrown. There's some wild flowers poking out through the uh, stone walls and uh, there's a bit of moss on the side of the shed. It's not exactly as he, as he designed it. There's a little bit of variation there. So one end of the spectrum is that we start from total order and we allow a little bit of wilderness to grow in. The other end of the spectrum is what I would call total chaos. So if you've ever kind of come to a house that's not been tended to for a while, or you've wandered around like an abandoned uh, building site or something like that, you'll find spaces which are completely overgrown. There is no control here whatsoever. This is not um, a manicured garden in any way. Um, there's weeds and long grasses and, and odd uh, flowers that you've never seen before. And some procedural generators start from these points as well. Um, so uh, a, a common example is um, the use of something called noise functions. So I don't know whether you've come across these before, um, but a noise function is uh, a way of essentially getting some uh, random looking numbers um, that have maybe some kind of regularity to them, but, but not in a predictable way. So what we're actually looking at here is two dimensional noise. It's actually something called Perlin noise. Um, and you don't need to know exactly what that means, but essentially if we give this function two numbers, um, it will give us a number between one and zero as the output. So every pixel on this image that you're seeing here, um, the X and Y coordinates of the pixel have been fed to this function, and it's given us a number between zero and one. And then we've mapped that to a color on the grayscale between white and black, where like zero is white, one is black, and then 0.5 is gray. And what you get with this noise function is you get a very kind of cloudy image. You, you get a sort of unpredictable, but very textured um, output. And what people use, do is they use these noise functions to create organic looking things. So they were used a lot in textures back in the 90s to, to make like fire or clouds. But a really common application of them is to make worlds. So if we map um, these numbers to kind of height, um, we can create maps. So this colored image here, the white is sort of the tips of a mountain. And then there's like the brown hills, the green grass, yellow beaches down into a shallow water and then ocean. And all we've done here is mapped the noise function to colors and it's created a kind of world map for us sort of. And this is also can also be done in 3D. And in fact, it's actually how Minecraft uh, creates its worlds. Now, there are often, you know, a, a noise function on its own won't do it for us. So what often happens is like, this is not an interesting world to play in. And so when people build these, build games using this uh, sort of uh, approach, what they often do is they often like combine different noise functions. Um, by the way, this was an oversight by me. If you're blue, green, colorblind, I apologize. This basically just looks like the background image. It's just recolored. Um, but what they'll do is they'll get multiple noise functions um, and then they might kind of 
stretch them or rotate them and lay them over one another. And then what we could say is um, this extra noise function that we've got could decide where we're going to put trees in our world. Um, but maybe it's a special kind of tree that only grows up a mountain. And so we have this sort of rule that says if the uh, height map is above a certain height and the tree noise function is above a certain value, then you can place a tree there or something. So this is obviously, uh, I'm obviously waving my hands a lot here, but um, these are the kind of approaches that are used in games like Minecraft. So Minecraft uses lots and lots of noise functions and randomness, um, but then it has ways of shaping them and lots of rules that sort of prune and control exactly how they come out. Um, but the difference between the approach we looked at before with Spelunky is that this is starting out with something which is very unpredictable, and then we're sort of refining it over time. So Minecraft's world generator is the result of a lot of small tweaks and changes by people until they get something that they feel looks okay. And there's a lot of disadvantages and advantages to using this approach over a handcrafted approach. Um, one disadvantage is that this is very unpredictable, but it's also very organic. It's very... Uh, interesting to walk around in, which is one of the reasons why it's so pleasant to run around Minecraft. So these are what I think of as sort of the two starting points for most procedural generators. Some of us start out from something that we feel confident making, something that we have a lot of control over, and then we give up some of that control. Others start out with something completely random that, that may be kind of messy and doesn't, isn't what we want. And then they find ways of filtering and shaping until they get to something which, um, which they can use. And to me, procedural generation is about everything in between those two extremes. It's about figuring out exactly which parts of your garden you want to become overgrown and which parts you want to be tightly controlled. Um, and that's where the joy of experimenting in the same way that Emily Short did with her travel guide um, comes from, I think. So I wanted to take a little detour here um, to talk about that first type of generator that, that we talked about with um, Spelunky and making something from something that we're already confident making. So um, I don't completely know uh, all of your backgrounds watching this talk, but one thing that I found a lot with procedural generation is that a lot of people are maybe a little bit hesitant or they don't know how to start. And a lot of people think that they should focus on the right algorithm. They should look for the right technique or technology. Um, and I wanted to talk about a very different approach today that all of you can go home today and do without touching any code at all and start thinking about what it means to generate something. Start thinking about those processes. And um, I've decided to stretch the gardening metaphor even further by talking about rewilding. So um, rewilding is a, a word from ecology and biology, um, and it's essentially the process of letting somewhere revert back to its natural state. So if you have somewhere like farmland that's been very controlled over many years, um, rewilding is sort of allowing that farmland to become run over with things that would have grown there before, lots of animals return, that kind of thing. Um, and it's quite a big thing at the moment in the UK, funnily enough. So what I want to show you today is sort of how you can go about the process of rewilding something which maybe you're confident in making. So what I'm imagining for this section is maybe you are someone who hasn't used procedural generation before, maybe even is a bit skeptical, but you are really good at writing or level design or music composition or something. So how can you begin to think about what, what this technique means and how it could be useful for you? So what you can do is you can get some pen and paper. Um, and uh, in this case, I already had some cards, so I kind of cheated a bit. But what I did was I built, um, I drew some buildings that um, I thought were cute. Um, and however you do this, um, you might decide that you want to write some text or compose some music or draw something else, like some people. Um, at some point, you're going to need to find some places to kind of cut them up into pieces. Um, it's great if they're kind of all roughly the same size, like I have here with my convenient cards. Um, and then we're going to essentially build a generator out of this process. Um, so once you've done this, uh, you can sort of flip over all of your cards and shuffle them together. Um, and the reason we flip them over is because we want to think about how our code views this content. So our procedural generator doesn't know anything about level design, it doesn't know anything about drama or story writing, it, it just knows whatever information we give it. So we start out with no information at all, shuffle the cards out, and then think about what structure we want to lay these cards in. So if you saw before, I had them kind of like a roof and then a building. 
And so I'm imagining, this is kind of my imagined rule for, for, for generating some. So I'm gonna place two cards on top of each other from the shuffle pile and then flip them over and see what I get. And of course, one of the problems is that because I haven't given any information to my generator, um, we can produce things that don't make sense. So you can have a roof on top of another roof. Um, so this is clearly not what we want. Um, you might get similar results if you're generating something else like a head on top of another head or a body without any feet or, or whatever that, that may not fit the uh, thing that you're looking for. So that's fine. So at this point, you're gonna get a pen and we're gonna flip those cards back over and we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of information. So you could limit yourself just to sort of doodling on the back with a particular color, some kind of tag or like a single word, but you can't write like a full description of what it is. It has to be like one word, something very simple, something just to give you a bit of guidance. Um, and actually for this stage, it's even better if um, once you've done this, instead of you dealing out the cards, um, you actually give it to like a friend or someone else, someone who really doesn't know what's on the other side of them. And once we've added this bit of data, this is kind of like giving information to our, our generative algorithm, right? So we can now have a slightly different um, set of rules for when we're generating this. So instead of just putting two cards, we can now say, okay, well, we want the top card to say roof on the back and the bottom card to say building. Um, and this is an additional bit of information. We're using some of this uh, data that we've given our system. And now we get a, a nice building out of it because we've, we've created some constraints and our generator sort of knows a bit more about what to do. And we've actually got a cool output. We've got a bakery that has an observatory on the top, um, which is like interesting, you know, it's a bit different. And of course you might not want this. You might want this, this might be kind of inappropriate for what you need your buildings for. So you might need to add more uh, labels or more information or change the way you generate. But once we've got this down, we can actually think about, well, now that I've got this basic system, I could create two story buildings. I could create a building with a roof and then two buildings underneath. And you begin to think about how you could extend your generator. And then as you do this, and this is again, going back to the cycle of like extending and then looking at it and thinking, you can see here that, oh, the second story actually has a door on it, which means if someone walked out of this door, they would fall one story down and then hit their head on the floor. So this is no good. So, you know, we go back and we add some more labels. Maybe we add a label to the bottom that says, okay, this is a ground floor building. This has a door on it. Um, and then we add some second story buildings that don't have doors. So we, we have this cycle of going back and forth and extending our generator, adding little bits of information. And we don't need to write any code. We can think about how are we changing the space of possibilities with what we do. So every time we change our process for dealing the cards out, every time we change the cards in our deck, every time we add a different label to the back of one of these cards, we're changing the possible things that this set of cards can represent. And that's really at the heart of procedural generation is thinking about all of these possibilities and thinking about how you can shape the ones that you want to make them more likely and get rid of the ones that you don't want to make them less likely and think about how much surprise and unpredictability you want in there. And really these paper-based approaches are very effective. Um, often we want to do something very complicated. We want to do something very fancy that uses the state of the art cutting edge stuff, but that doesn't always make us better at using procedural generation. And actually Derek Yu's Spelunky generator is still probably the best example of a procedural generator in any game ever, because it was exactly what that game needed. It was perfect for that game design. And so even though this approach seems very simple, it really is something that you can play around with yourself. And because you will be experts in different things to me, um, you know, I don't know exactly where the best place is to cut up a piece of music or what the best labels are for pieces of text. You might think that instead of chopping a piece of music after the fourth bar, it might be better to chop it uh, horizontally along each instrument and connect instruments together instead of bars. Um, you might have different ideas about what labels to use to describe uh, descriptions of items or characters. But this basic thing of chopping something up, labeling it and reassembling it like a jigsaw is the foundation of a lot of really impressive uh, procedural generators. And it's, it's not complicated. It's, it's something that you can really get started with very easily and start thinking about many of the issues that the field has. So I talked a, a little bit about why I think um, gardening is a good metaphor for procedural generation and how you can think about this process of 
sort of iteratively changing a generator, thinking about what it does, going back to it and changing it again. Um, and I wanted to sort of back that up by showing you some of the things I've used procedural generation for. Um, some of them complicated, some of them simple. Um, and uh, I'm going to try and squeeze in some demos if I can as well. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was a game I was developing called Rogue Process. Um, Rogue Process was an action uh, platformer, kind of in the vein of Spelunky, where you broke into skyscrapers and uh, hacked security systems to steal things from corporations. Um, so I wanted the skyscrapers that you broke into to be procedurally generated. I wanted them to be different every time. Um, but I also wanted to be able to quite tightly control the kinds of experiences that you had in them. And so I ended up using an approach very similar to Spelunky's. So what you're seeing here is a catalog of loads of different rooms that I designed by hand um, and that the game would assemble uh, kind of like Spelunky's levels by gluing them together and um, making a, a whole level out of them. And just like the example we just saw with the buildings and cards and writing on the back of them, each one of these rooms is labeled um, and the labels don't tell it uh, sort of whether it's a, a building or a roof or anything, but in this case, they tell it where you can exit each room from. Um, so if I show you a zoomed in example, uh, you can see the room in the uh, sort of center of the screen. You can exit it from the bottom left and you can exit it from the bottom right. And those are the labels that this room has um, in case the level generator needs to know kind of where can I place this room? What should be placed next to it? So this would never try and have you exit from the top left because there's a wall there, you can't get there. So the labels here help the procedural generator know where exactly it can place it physically in the, um, in the building. And the nice thing about this is it means I have complete control over everything inside the room and the algorithm just needs to know about how to connect them up. So it really is just like a jigsaw. And much like uh, Spelunky, we also took an approach where there's sort of random variation inside. So the traps that you can see in the bottom right and the boxes that you can see in the bottom left, they're all randomly added to this room. So they're not always here. Um, they will be here sometimes and they won't be here other times, or there might be something different there. Um, and this is also great because it means that I can easily play the game, see how a room feels, go back to the editor, change it, and then come back again. So this was a very simple approach. It was because the game did not need anything more complicated. Um, ultimately, this was a, an action platforming game. Um, it, it just needed a little bit of procedural generation, just a little bit of wilderness and unpredictability. Um, I did have uh, just a little, uh, this is from like an early trailer for the game, um, just in case you wanted to see, although this was actually when the game had a very different um, procedural generator, ironically. I couldn't find any footage of um, the game like after that point. Um, so procedural generation here is not the focus, as you can see. The focus is, you know, hacking things and moving around. Um, and so the game's procedural generator is simpler and it kind of sits in the background. And that's often all a game needs. Now, if we want to look at slightly more interesting uses of procedural generation, I guess, um, I wanted to talk to you about some games I'm working on now. Um, so this is a series of games, um, Nothing Beside Remains, which I made a few years ago, Condition Unknown, which I made in 2019, and Stargrave, which I started last year and I'm still working on. So these were all game jam entries, but Stargrave I couldn't finish. So um, I'm, I'm sort of working on it every now and again uh, when I have time. So these three games are, they, they all have a, a similar core approach. Um, and it's what my uh, incoming PhD student Florence calls generative archeology span games. So Florence is uh, an archeologist um, themselves and uh, is bringing all of this knowledge to their PhD when they start next month. And we'll actually be looking at these games from a, a perspective of archeology span and kind of combining that with procedural generation. So what do we mean by generative archeology span games? So the way these games work is we generate um, a, a kind of a very small world. So it could be like a village or a spaceship or a, a research station somewhere, um, but it's quite, it's quite small and contained. Um, and then we run a simulation of this world and record what happens. And the important thing about the simulation is that it always ends. So you'll see what I mean by this in a second, but basically it's not possible for it to go on forever. There is definitely gonna be a reason why this simulation finishes. And then once it's done, we put the player at the, in the world that results and we let them kind of wander around and uh, explore and kind of understand what happened. 
So if you've played information games like Return of the Obra Dinn or um, The Outer Wilds, um, it's a little bit like those, but with some procedural generation behind them. So we're using procedural generation to create this uh, big messy world, but it's a big messy world that has a real history, like everything is simulated. So the player can go and see and learn about what happened. Um, and I've been trying to experiment with how exactly we can have that kind of make fun gameplay. So in Nothing Beside Remains, Nothing Beside Remains looks pretty ugly. Um, I made this in 48 hours, so uh, there, was, there is no art. Um, but uh, basically, I simulated like a very simple farming village. Um, and I simulated things like the health of the ecosystem, how good their farms were, um, the kind of whether they were getting attacked by wild animals, things like that. And eventually the population of the village kind of dwindles down to zero, people leave, or there's sort of a famine or something like that. And then hundreds of years later, you turn up and can explore the village. And as you explore, um, the village sort of tells a story of what happened. So if you can find a church, for example, um, the people that lived in the village will have engraved things that represent kind of the struggles that their village was facing. So in this example, um, there's an engraving of fields of, of crops growing. And that means that this village probably had problems with their farming. So they were sort of praying for, for better um, harvests. So this was a very basic idea. It was really just how would people kind of respond to um, sort of exploring the aftermath of a, of a simulation. Um, and people were quite interested and they even wrote some reports sort of hypothesizing what they think happened to the villages that they explored. So the next year, I wanted to take this a little bit further. Um, and what I did was I built something called Condition Unknown. So if you know about the movie The Thing, um, which is a great movie, it's uh, based on this. Essentially, there's a research station in the Arctic. There are six crew members researching there. And one day, a monster uh, gets unleashed. And um, they, the crew either sort of perish fighting it, or some of them might escape. And you turn up after all of this is finished. Um, and in the style of Return of the Obra Dinn, you have to identify all six crew members and figure out what happened to them. Um, and the way that we did this is I built a much more detailed simulation. So if everyone in the research station has like um, a routine that they go through, and this routine can be interrupted by things. So if they spot something like a fire or they spot the monster or something like that, their routine will change. But crucially, it's not just that they'll react. It's not just that we're simulating their behaviors but they will do certain things that leave traces behind for the player to find later intentionally. So in Condition Unknown, then the crew members radio each other and we record every radio conversation they have, basically. It's all templated text, it's very simple, but because it represents real events, um, it allows the player to do kind of detective work later on. So I think what I'm gonna do here is um, I'm going to uh, experiment by attempting to show you this. Let's see. Um, hopefully you can see this. Let me know if you can't. Um, and it, this has some kind of interesting consequences that I didn't realize. So you, you start out, I have no idea what this is, by the way, because um, every single one of these is procedurally generated. And one of the problems is that um, often it produces um, uh, sort of unsolvable uh, uh, problems. There we go. OK, here's our way in. So we can see here, for example, that this, this section of wall has been destroyed. Um, and this barrel here, there are, there's descriptions in the bottom left, but it doesn't work very well at this resolution. But this says that this uh, barrel has been destroyed, which means that there was probably a fire here that exploded. Um, and we can see that like this person is wearing a lab coat. They have burns on them that suggest they perished in a fire. So if we look at sort of the list of the crew, we might guess that this is probably one of the researchers. Um, and that can be part of our final report. But the important thing about the simulation is that um, if we find a terminal here and we read a message, um, we can see here that like this crew member, Victor Hansen, sent a message at 1049 that they had seen something invading the station, that they said it was outside the corridor in lab one. And none of this is you know, faked. This was real. So we can know that when they sent this message, they were probably standing somewhere where they could see lab one. And the players can do like quite sophisticated kind of um, uh, they can intuit quite sophisticated things just by the knowledge that this is a, a sort of a real um, uh, simulation. So 
I really, you know, I got even more encouraged by the response to that. People really um, liked this, even though it was it was a jam game. I mean, it, it didn't really, it didn't function properly. Um, there was a lot of things wrong with it. Um, but the year after, I began to work on a game called Stargrave. Um, and the way that Stargrave works is we simulate a spaceship with all of its crew, um, and something bad happens that leads to the spaceship being abandoned. So it could just be that they kind of crash into an asteroid and they have to abandon ship, or it could be that there was a mutiny or something like that. Um, and you turn up and your only objective is to fix the ship and then sort of fly it home to sell it. So what we're trying to do here is um, in Nothing Beside Remains, the procedural generation was kind of the focus, but the player didn't really have to do anything. I just said, you know, explore and have fun and see what you think. In Condition Unknown, there was a, an objective tied to the procedural generation. So you had to identify the six crew members, you had to figure out what happened to them. And the problem with that was that that wasn't always possible. Because these are simulations, I don't have any kind of drama management. There's no AI deciding you know, what is appropriate or what's solvable. And it meant that some players just couldn't solve their particular mystery. So in Stargrave, I'm trying to find a balance here where the ship is always fixable. There's always a way to kind of get, get the solution to fixing the ship. And the crew are sort of an optional mystery. You don't need to find out what happened to the crew, but you can if you want. You can find logs from them. They are obviously usually responsible for the ship crashing. And it might help you fix the ship, but it's not, it's not a compulsory part of the system. So it's interesting in that sense because I'm trying to balance how much involvement the player has to have with this procedural generator. And to go back to our idea of kind of wilderness, um, these games are unconstrained simulations. There's no, there's no filters on them or anything like that. So it's a lot closer to our wilderness example than our ornamental garden example. And that's why I'm having to be very careful with how I design the player's relationship with this content, because we don't want to force them to sort of, uh, we don't want to test them on how good this, this content is, because we don't know. It's very chaotic. It's very wild. In the same way that Minecraft doesn't like challenge you to get from A to B, because it doesn't always know if that's possible. Instead, it just leaves you in this generated world, and it trusts you to sort of explore and find your own kind of fun. So I'm looking forward to, to working more on this, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's much harder than the previous two. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is Puck. So um, I, you are the first group of people I've talked to about this. Um, Miriam at the beginning said that uh, I have built a, a software called Angelina, which is true. Um, and the next version of the software, Angelina is getting a name change. So. Um, Angelina will be known as Puck, and um, my, my version of Puck will be called Angelina, probably. Um, but I'm hoping that Puck will be something that you can download and have your own version of that designs games, and that you can have your own kind of uh, connection to and customization of. Um, now, Puck is still in sort of testing, <laughs> I would say. There's still quite a lot of work to do. But um, I'm taking a very different approach with it this time. And I'm really trying to focus more on um, an AI that you as game developers could maybe relate to as like a coworker or a colleague. So something that works much slower, something that is more talkative, more communicative. Um, and in general, it, it works in a way that we don't always think AI of as kind of working. It's much more focused on how it relates to other people in its, in its creative community, people like you, hopefully. So um, I don't have time to tell you a lot in depth about Puck, but I did just want to talk a little bit about the background of automated game design. So these are some games that my previous systems, Angelina, have made. So there's arcade games in the top left-hand corner. Then we tried to make games about news, like platformers based around news articles in the bottom left. Um, Angelina entered a game jam. Um, it made some 3D games in the top right. And then in the bottom right, I began to work on like a version of it where you could watch it design games. Um, and this is sort of a screenshot of what that looked like. So it could actually stream on Twitch and you could watch it sort of build games, test rule sets, uh, invent levels, and then kind of ask it questions in the chat. And this is something which I never fully finished with Angelina. And so I've, I've started with Puck and this is sort of like the main focus. So the idea is that Puck is something that you watch work. It's not something that kind of lives on my laptop like it used to. Um, hopefully it will be something which you will be able to interact with yourself, fingers crossed. So the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because I wanted to encourage you to 
kind of get a bit silly with procedural generation if you want to. Um, so we think about procedural generation, we think about generating like levels, we think about generating maybe music, um, store a bit of text. But procedural generation can be applied to anything and you don't need to invent a, a complicated technique often to make that happen. So let me tell you a little bit currently about how Puck uh, designs rules for games. So this is a description of noughts and crosses. Um, so the players take turns placing pieces on a three by three grid. The first player to get three in a row wins. And just like we did before with the level designs in Spelunky or the uh, buildings written on pieces of card, we can just find places to cut uh, in this description. We can just find things that can be replaced by other things. So if I pull out these three segments of text and I put in something else instead, um, now it says players take turns dropping pieces onto a seven by six grid. The first player to get four in a row wins. And now we've suddenly transformed this into connect four with very little change really. Um, and I'm sure that most of you could think of, you know, loads of things that we could slot into all of these different slots to make up um, completely different rules. We could pull ideas from board games, from video games, and we can just have the system kind of randomly mix stuff up. Um, and in fact, just by looking at sort of very, very common folk games or, or board games, um, that one at the bottom is kind of a joke, it's from Go. Um, but lots of rules are kind of simple. Um, and even a simple rule space is very interesting to explore with an AI. Now, the problem with um, designing uh, in spaces like this is that if you look at Spelunky's level generator, Basically, any combination of level segments is fun, um, and it takes like a, a fraction of a second to generate. It's one of the best things about the generator is that it can't really fail. Um, however, when you come to designing something like game rule sets, what you find very quickly is that even a few different rule variations result in a possibility space that is just full of bad designs. Um, rules are very, very delicate. And again, this is something which you, you develop a feel for the more generation that you do. Um, and so what we end up with is something which is actually full of a lot of wilderness um, and it's very hard to sort of filter for. Now, this is sort of a problem if you work in sort of the big games industry because you want reliability. And that's one of the reasons why you don't hear much about automated game design from the games industry because it's just, it's just not there yet. It's not something that they're super interested in. But wilderness can be kind of fun. Um, it can throw out a lot of things that you don't expect. It can help you explore places that people wouldn't explore normally. Um, a lot of bad designs can become really interesting designs if you make a few small tweaks. And I think it's also worth pointing out that building Puck and building Angelina has made me a better game designer because thinking about spaces of possibilities and spaces of outputs um, helps you think about what it means to design a game. It helps you think about what a rule set is why is noughts and crosses or tic-tac-toe uh, designed the way it is? Um, why are certain rules good in almost any game and other rules um, not? What does it mean for a game to be strategically exciting or interesting? One of the fun things about working on this version of Puck is realizing that lots of very famous games that we play as kids just aren't very good on paper. Like they shouldn't be very good, but they are fun to play. Like, there's nothing really exciting about Connect Four if you were to compare it. You know, if you were to ask a chess grandmaster to look at it, they wouldn't. They wouldn't understand why you thought it was interesting. But it's really fun to play Connect Four, and so by thinking about these small, tiny problems, um, it helps you think more about the bigger picture. It helps you focus on things that you that you might ignore when you're stuck in traditional game design uh, mindsets. So one of the ways that that we use to sort of filter out that wilderness um, with Puck is that we get Puck to play these games. So this is sort of a, it was the only video I could get because Puck, Puck makes a lot of bad games. So you're seeing kind of an animation here of a very bad game being played, but you can see the, the squares are changing color as it plays the game. And you can see its score is going up on the right. And what Puck does is Puck records every single game it plays and it keeps all the data, even the games that are really bad, even the games that are obviously bad, that, that you can't even place anything on the board. And that's because understanding what makes a bad game is as important. So this wilderness is important for Puck to go through, I think. Um, and I think in the long run, it makes it a better game designer, or at least that's what I'm hoping. Um, and I thought I'd show you just, just one more um, uh, quick demo. I think I've got time. Um, very briefly, uh, which was something which Puck came out of um, very recently. And this is a two-player game, 
but Puck mixed in some of its rules from games like Bejeweled, match three games. So you take turns placing um, uh, icons on a board, and your objective is to have more pieces on the board than your opponent. And obviously, if we were just going to play back and forth with no other rules, I would win because I went first. But if you make four in a row, all of your pieces disappear. Um, and so you play this very delicate game of cat and mouse with the AI, where you're both trying not to make four in a row, and you're trying to force the other person to make four in a row. And it turns out this is a really good game, but it's so counterintuitive that when I first saw it, I thought Puck had made a mistake because it just doesn't seem interesting. It doesn't seem good. Um, I'll try and uh, make a, um, uh, I'll try and get like a, a link to this particular game for you so you can play it later. Um, because just looking at it doesn't really get it across, but play a game of it, see if you can beat the AI and see what you think. Um, so Puck isn't at the point where it's like making amazing games yet, but it's, it's coming up with things which are interesting, things that I hadn't thought of. Um, and I put that down to kind of going through the wilderness. I put that down to that because most people avoid that. They, they don't want to go through these weird ideas, um, but AI are able to explore those spaces for us and come up with interesting um, alternatives. So I think I'm at a point where I should begin my wrap up. So I've just got a few slides that I want to leave you with. If you go online and you read things about procedural generation, you're going to see a lot of like GDC talks about consistency and player experience and how people feel about the content and things like that. And that is important if you're designing games, it is. But the one thing that I want you to, to take away from today is that building a procedural generator is a craft, it's a practice. And it can be something that you enjoy doing even if you don't use what comes out the other end. I've built a lot of generators that weren't used for anything. I just wanted to, to, to have that feeling of making something that makes something. Um, and I, I liken it to something like painting or stitching or something like that, a creative art form that's just sort of fun for the sake of it. And to stretch the gardening metaphor a little bit further, you know, you don't, may, you don't have a garden so that you can grow flowers to pick and sell or, or give to people. Um, part of it is just the joy of engaging with nature and learning about all the different insects and, and flowers that are in your garden and having that experience about sort of just being there while something grows, you know, and then appreciating your hard work afterwards. And there's this thing in procedural generation called the thousand bowls of oatmeal problem. And it's used to criticize uh, procedural generators that aren't very uh, good. Um, so the idea is that, you know, if you make a thousand bowls of oatmeal, they're all unique, they're all different, but they all kind of look the same. They're very boring. You know, people don't want that. They want a procedural generator that makes lots of different types of content. But the thing I want to just leave you with is the idea of uh, what it would actually take to build a machine that made bowls of oatmeal. Like people spend a lot of time perfecting their oatmeal recipe and finding the exact balance of ingredients that they like. And I imagine that if you built a machine to make the perfect bowl of oatmeal, you would learn a lot about not just oatmeal, but cooking in general, your own tastes. Um, and it would be a kind of a large project probably. And so when we think about things like this, when we think about procedural generators, it's easy to get tied up in just thinking about the output, but it's also about the process of making. Um, and that's kind of the thing I wanted to give to you today. It's so, you know, we talked about how a procedural generation is like tending to a garden. We talked about the two types of garden, total control, total chaos. Um, this is uh, someone's garden where they've ended up getting rid of a bit of wilderness. Um, and we also talked about thinking about processes and thinking about um, what you want to achieve with a generator, right? So it's not about the algorithms you use or anything like that. It's about your understanding of what you're making and how you want to cut it up and reshape it. Um, and that's really the most important thing. It's just playing around and practicing. And above all else, I hope that you sort of enjoy the process of making things that make things. So it's, you know, that slogan for Prop Jam is not just about getting in there and having the finished result. It's all about having the fun of experimenting with generative systems and learning something about the thing that you're making um, as you do so. Okay, that wasn't so bad for time. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. Um, there's more things from me on my website, possibilityspace.org, including a couple of tutorials about procedural generation and that have little interactive JavaScript like level generators that you can click and change. So you might like that if you've liked some of the stuff I've talked about today. Um, and as I said at the beginning, if you want to talk to me about anything, you can tweet at me, you can email me. And I also wanted to shout out both of my amazing PhD students, Eunice and Florence, 
Um, you should follow both of them on Twitter as well, because they're doing very exciting work um, in these sorts of areas. So if you like this talk, you'll like what they're doing as well. Um, and yeah, that's all I've got to say. I, I hope it was uh, I hope it was interesting and I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you so much for having me. Wow, oh, Mike, what an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Big applaud. Uh, I don't know. Should I should I keep that slide up, or do you want to see my face? What do you? No, prefer? we want to. I, I, we would like to see your face, uh, don't we? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> if you don't, I mean, this this is uh, this is recorded uh, uh, anyway. So, like, I don't know how how to watch look into this camera, but uh, this is recorded anyway. So it's it's going to be there. Uh, the slide. Um, how. Uh, do you have any questions, like right off the bat? Yes? Uh, what uh, do you know about Houdini? Is this, uh, uh, is that something we should, as artists, like look into? Or... Yeah. Uh, Houdini um, is uh, oh, something okay. that is... So I've, I've not used Houdini myself. If Houdini is what I'm thinking of, it's a tool. Um, there are a lot of kind of visual effects tools and things like that, which um, allow you to sort of uh, make generative materials or shaders or effects and things like that. I think they're really, they're really cool tools. Um, and especially if you want to go into the games industry, I think you might find it like a useful tool to pick up in the same way that you might learn, you know, Photoshop or something like that. Um, there are, if, if you do want to get into this kind of thing, though, there are kind of, I don't know how expensive Houdini is, um, but there are kind of free ways that you, you can get started by looking at sort of old school attempts to generate shaders for things, um, looking at those noise function stuff, looking at the demo scene. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there are a lot of people, it was, it was more a thing, I guess, in the 90s and the early noughties. Um, of writing the smallest programs you could that made these beautiful 3D uh, animations. And you might like that as well for the same sort of thing. Um, but if you can get a copy of Houdini, I think it, it would be an interesting thing for you to pick up, especially if you're a visual artist, for sure. Cool. The demo scene was huge, at least in the 90s in Stockholm. I'm not sure like how it is now. Um, more... there's, still, there's still some people going on with it. <laughs> More, more questions. Uh, I'm also going to check if, oh, oh, Kate says something. Uh, Bizarre Barber uh, is a game that uses Houdini to create characters for a VR game. Um, Hi, Kate. Yeah, she's also posting uh, a Twitch link here in the chat. Uh, those of you who are attending through Zoom, uh, do you have questions? I, I can read them out for, for Mike. So I have to say that it's super interesting to hear about Puck. Uh, and <laughs> it's really, I really look forward to, to seeing uh, what, what's, uh, what's gonna happen with that. And if you want to, it would be really, if you could send that link uh, uh, that you said for the game that you showed last, that would be really nice. Now I'm kind of, I'm trying to look at you at the screen. That's why I'm looking away. So this the room set up is-, is I'll, um... I'll send you a big list of uh, sort of things that I've mentioned in the talk um, in case people just want to sort of, you know, it's easier to send around via email than maybe. Um, so yeah. links to things like Annals of the Perigues as well and some of my other work that people might be interested in. Um, yeah. And if you're interested in automated game design, I made a much longer talk about that, which is um, it's edited more like a YouTube essay. So it's very light. There's, it, you know, there's, uh, it covers a lot of ground. It covers the history of the field. So if you're interested in Puck specifically, any of you, um, I'll link you to that video as well. You might be interested in that. Thanks. That would be fun. Uh, there was something, I was kind of making notes while you were talking um, about things I wanted to uh, remember that is hardly possible to read. Something like, I mean, you talked about this uh, oatmeal uh, problem and we have, uh, talked about it um, during the course as well, kind of in relation to, to um, some very well-known games. Um, and, and that's something, so when we have been talking about PCG and machine learning, we have been discussing the fact that, uh, well, the oatmeal problem, obviously, um, in PCG, 
Uh, and when we have been talking about machine learning, we have been uh, also talking about what kind of data do you uh, feed into, into, your, um, uh, into the learning uh, algorithms. We looked at the, you know, you remember Tay from, from 2016 that this Microsoft bot that kind of ended up in this catastrophe. And I was curious, like, Mike, if you, like, do you use any machine learning at all? And if you would, uh, how would you like go about it? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I actually, I, it's been funny to watch machine learning expand over the last decade because um, over the last few years, I, I now get stu uh, questions from students asking, asking about the machine learning I use in Angelina. They just assume I do. They don't even ask if I do. So at the moment, I don't use um, any machine learning at all in any of these systems. And part of the reason is because of computational creativity, which is that field I mentioned at the beginning, where I really want, to, I want Puck to be able to explain itself. And I also want people to be able to feel they really understand what Puck is doing. They can see each sort of step of the process. Um, and machine learning systems can explain themselves uh, to some degree. It's, there's a lot of research going into that. But it's not quite there yet. And I think people, there's still a big gap in public understanding as well. So I really like keeping that, that away. However, that said, um, I think Puck might be the first system I use a bit of machine learning in. And what I'm hoping to do is have it learn from its own in its own kind of experiences. So it plays a lot of games um, and it records everything it plays about them. And so hopefully I'm hoping it can kind of learn only on what it has seen um, rather than uh, what other people have seen. And part of the reason for that is that I'm hoping that like your puck um, might have different experiences to mine. And in the future, I don't know if you remember, Miriam, but when we were at the Shonan Institute, um, we yeah. had a work group where we talked about sort of AI systems that, that learned from the history of games or that could share their experiences with each other. Um, and that was, was very influential. That, that's made me kind of think about that stuff. So I'd love to um, include include a bit of that in the future, but right right now I don't. But there's some there's some like terrific work out there. Um, I would look at the work of Matthew Guzdial, for example, um, Ahmed Khalifa. Um, I'm blanking on some names here. Anurag Sarkar as well. Maybe I'll add some of those to the to the list of links I send you as well um, for some of the students who are interested in in PCG and ML. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah. and because I kind of thought about that when you talked about Puck and mentioned that you, you also had Puck talking and you know telling about uh, their process uh, so that you could chat chat with them. Um, that was like yeah, I can't wait to to see more of that work. Thank you. Uh, and well, hopefully, I can maybe maybe I can still come to Stockholm someday and see um, all of you and uh, and give another lecture in person. Yeah, we, we, we let's find a way. I mean, it's it's Europe. We should that 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 would be great. Uh, let's see. We have we are running out of time. It's two minutes to five. Uh, so let's keep in touch i'm going to post all the links and everything uh, that mike sends on our course uh, website uh, so that you can get access to it and also i'll, I'll cut this talk and, and and put it up so mike thank you so much again for uh, for joining us it was uh, very much appreciated um, my pleasure thank you all for having me it was great it was really great yeah and hope to see you soon post pandemic Definitely. Yeah. Take care, everyone. And uh, yeah, get in touch whenever I'm always here to chat. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Cheers.